Hello and welcome to a new episode here on the Warf's Rebellion podcast for Age Soul War. Today we are going to California, sunny Southern California again. And instead of lemons and oranges, we're going to talk about wine, which is going to be amazing. Hopefully you have a wine glass to enjoy while we while you listen to this conversation today. Our guest today is Julia Ornelas Hickton. She is a assistant professor of history at CSU Channel Islands. Beautiful campus. You should look it up. Uh, she has a PhD from the University of Southern California. And her book that we are going to talk about, which came out in November of 2023 with the University of Nebraska Press, is beautifully entitled the grapes of conquest race labor and the industrialization of california wine 1769 to 1920 julia wonderful to have you on the podcast thank you for taking the time so yeah. let me right again right away start here and ask how do you write a book about wine? Oh, that's a great question. And thanks for the invitation and for having me. I'm really happy to be here. You're uh, my book really grew out of a general interest of, on agriculture in California. I am the granddaughter of braceros, who were Mexican contract workers in the early 20th century. And I thought I was going to write a dissertation about Mexican migrant laborers in California. But as I started to research, I made this realization that Chinese workers were involved in the wine industry and that just piqued my interest. So I moved, I pushed myself further back. And, you know, I'd always had an interest in citrus. That's huge to, mm -hmm. it's usually important to the state of California, to our history. And I just landed serendipitously on wine, realizing that very little scholarship had been written on the pre-World War II history of the industry. So that is how I ended up with this with this book. Which is phenomenal to think about because it's like you, you have such a rich history in your book, which is all pre, almost all pre-First World War. <laughs> so it's like, how can you overlook this? Yeah. It's like, a great uh, question. Yeah, it's a really great question. You know, like it's like you're you're showing it goes back into colonial times when the first Spanish arrived with some missions. So it's kind of like you have hundreds of years of of wine growing. How do you not like why has no one ever talked about this? Is it what do you what's your thought about it? Why why do you think it is? You know, I think there's multiple reasons for that. One the citrus industry lasted so long. Um, mm. You know, its cultural impact really began in the 1880s in Southern California. And mm. we still have people today mm -hmm. um, who remember working in the packing houses at their height. Of course, right. today, those packing houses are now condos and shops. But in my county here in Ventura County, where I am located, citrus is still very important. Mm -hmm. So I think the legacy of citrus has perhaps um, been more omnipresent in 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 folks' awareness, um, mm. but I don't think that's that's not an excuse. I mean, we still drink wine; right. it's still very important to the state's economy. Um, I think the other answer I would give is that historians. I would say really, really recently have started to turn a more critical eye to the missions mm. and as mm. has the public, yeah. we no longer accept them as these, you know, neutral spaces, mm. um, spaces okay. of public memory. So I think that critical eye is also really important to looking at what really happened in the missions mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and the labor there and what was created, what was grown, et cetera. Right. No, yeah, it's. I mean, it's. I, I'm hoping that California does more with it because the missions are such a very, like, it's still a tourist attraction, but it's such a, like, multi-layered and difficult and like, like bad history on so many levels too that you're mm -hmm. dealing with there. 
So <clears throat> the the other part that and it, I kind of find it fascinating because you have such a beautiful origin story with your personal experience in the book to start of like how you what was it you you went to a wine tasting and it struck you that they kind of have this embellished history at that winery you went to how how much is how often is that that these wineries just dare I say make things up to create a nice story for their wine yeah again a fantastic question because as you're pointing out with my own experience um and that of probably many of your listeners wine in california is intimately and intricately connected to tourism mm -hmm. wine is a food product right it's something yeah. restaurants buy it's something that's marketed around the world certainly california wine uh, particularly that that's coming out of napa and some noma has a certain cultural cachet right mm -hmm. Yet, when you go to the wineries, the history that I tell in my book, which is not, it's not always a pretty history. It's a, it's a history mm -hmm. of colonization and conquest mm -hmm. and race making. Mm -hmm. That history is strangely absent um, from the wineries. And I say this pretty confidently. I grew up in the shadow of the Napa and Sonoma Valley. Mm -hmm. when, when you grow up where I grew up, if you have family visiting from out of town, that's where you take them. <laughs> So since childhood, <laughs> I have memories of wandering, bored out of my mind, of course, really? wandering wineries, um, exploring the square in Sonoma. And the the mm. story that is told there really glosses over the complex legacy yeah. of that period. And then, you know, most of my book is really centered on Southern California. Mm -hmm. The history of wine growing in the Los Angeles region, it's beginning to be explored. There's folks doing amazing work in public history and sort of uh, peeling back the layers of land use in downtown Los Angeles yeah. and in Inglewood. But by and large, because the lines aren't here, it's just not part of the history that's told. Yeah. No, and I found it so fascinating where you, later in the book, you have that story about Anaheim, right? And like, I talk with Brian Jenkins a few weeks ago about his book about oranges and lemons and citrus growing in California. We all have that image, right, of Walt Disney buys these lemon and orange groves in Anaheim and turns it into Disneyland. And no one ever talks about like there being wine prior to to this to the to the citrus empire in that region. It's mm -hmm. it's it it almost feels like willful forgetting of like, we, we only remember that big industry because that's sort of the one that we want to remember, I guess. Yeah. That's such a, a great point, Niels. And I, you know, what many people don't know is that Anaheim was founded as a German colony by yeah. a group of Germans mm -hmm. who had immigrated to California in the 1850s. Uh, they weren't making it as gold miners, and they created this cooperative joint stock company, mm -hmm. hired someone to scout out land for them, buy it, and plant vineyards for them while they worked up mm -hmm. in San Francisco. And this became a thriving, successful yeah. wine town. Wine town. <laughs> this is essentially yeah. what it was. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, and it was really an amazing place. Um, it was this German island mm -hmm. surrounded by Mexican, California, Spanish-speaking neighbors, yeah, cattle ranchers, yeah. most of them. And they took up viticulture and sold their wine and did quite well for themselves until Anaheim disease struck. We now know it as Pierce's disease. Mm -hmm. But that essentially destroyed their entire um millions of vines, millions of vines. And slowly that spread across the Southland, which is why we don't associate wine with Anaheim anymore. Right, right. Um, one story that I wasn't able to include in the book, but I'll share with you now, um, is that if you've ever been to Disneyland and its neighboring park, California Adventures, mm -hmm. they had for many years uh, about three or four rows of grapevines planted in the park. Oh, and According to legend, um, those grapevines would get infected with Pierce's disease. Mm 
and have to be ripped out and replanted every couple of years. I tried very hard to verify this with the Disney Corporation, uh, but unfortunately, they never returned my emails or calls. Wasn't able to oh. validate this and include it in the book. I wish I had been able to uh, figure wow. out if that was actually true. Yeah, I may have to tax reasons. the Disney Corporation now in the, <laughs> when I release a video. Kind of be like, give yeah. us a statement. Yeah, but certainly yeah. wine is part of that part. Yeah. It's part of that park, even though they don't acknowledge that it literally that was a wine right. growing region. Uh, yeah, you know, that's crazy. 1850s to the 1890s. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. not part of Disney's history. Yeah. And it's sort of like you, you can think of like those counterfactuals, right? Of like, how would the Southland have been different if it hadn't been for that disease and wine would have continued and the rivalry between the orange growers and the wine growers potentially been much stronger or like, mm -hmm. like who knows, like if they had bought each other out or fought each other or what would have happened? It's interesting to consider that. And I will say that there was a little bit of a legacy with the wine industry. Um, as you mentioned, I, I end the book pretty much around world war one and the start of prohibition, but one legacy of Anaheim um, moving into prohibition. Um, and even before that, in the 19 mm -hmm. aughts and teens, when prohibition started gaining ground and individual towns and counties started to go dry, Anaheim never went dry. Uh -huh. It was a quote unquote wet island surrounded by dry towns in Orange County. So oh it was gosh. a watering hole for oil workers and citrus yeah. workers all around. So that legacy of, of culture and uh, that legacy and that culture that celebrated yeah. wine and beer consumption carried on until of course prohibition right. shut it down. That, that is just so fascinating to think of that, that, that place where the family park is today, or the family adventure, the kind of family friendly place was the drinking place of the region. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> Uh, I want to turn back, turns out to the, you mentioned that Anaheim being that, that sort of German island, and you have a lot of like, you have Germans, you have Italians, you have some French people in your books that you talk about as sort of um, individuals that start these wine, th these vineyards, or that um, are brought in to kind of fix problems with existing ones. And I kind of wondered, are these actual people that have any experience? experience with wine or are we just turning to them because it's like oh they're from germany they need they they know how to do wine or oh they're from france they know how to do wine is it just kind of like because you're from a country we think you know or is it that they actually know yeah you know many of these folks didn't have any experience yeah. with wine or even agriculture sometimes. If I go back to the Germans in Anaheim, none of them had experience with agriculture. They, none of them had any experience yeah. with um, winemaking. They had one person who had brewed beer in Germany, but it's a very different process. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they were really self-appointed experts uh, who, you know, educated themselves, figured yeah. it out, and I don't think it's a coincidence that many of these immigrants are all newcomers to California in the 1850s, uh, took up wine growing because this is also a period where the state started to organize trade groups and the California mm -hmm. State Agricultural Society. So there was an emphasis on scientific growing, on mm -hmm. getting educated, of course, the uh, University of California is founded in the late 1860s, and it yeah. had a College of Agriculture. So this is a very rich period for agriculture where mm. farmers and growers are looking to the experts. They're, mm -hmm. they're public, and these experts were publishing treatises, yeah. um, publishing the, the records of their meetings in the local newspapers. Mm -hmm. So growers would write to the experts and say, hey, I want to do, I want to start a vineyard. Okay. And they would get information back. Yeah. Um, so yes, they were not experienced, but 
they had ways to learn. And this was a very um, connected community. It's one of the arguments that I make, you know, about this professionalization Mm -hmm. of agriculture and laying the foundation on which citrus would later blossom. Um, It's because vineyardists put so much work down Mm -hmm. in establishing these networks and advocating for state money to found the University of California College of Agriculture to found the state agricultural society to pay for prizes and, uh, you know, to plant experimental vineyards. All of this was hugely important in establishing industrialized agriculture in California. Oh, wow. Yeah, true, true. Yeah. And like, I can see like writing to like a person like France or Italy to kind of get how do you do this? with regard to wine it's a lot easier if you're from the country that specific country yeah. in that language to kind of approach somebody and kind of solicit information or material the and, one or... Thing of clarification <laughs> mm-hmm. is they're not most of them are not writing to europe they're writing to oh. americans in california oh, okay and we had a few folks who were who had success in uh-huh. new york and missouri in the midwest sure um and they came to California, yeah. but by and large, they're just Internally. kind of learning on, learning on the ground here, oh. um, occasionally writing to Midwestern growers. Um, but what's interesting is in the 1850s, especially, mm-hmm. many of these new immigrant growers are simply reproducing the practices that had existed since the 1770s, <laughs> 1780s in Spanish California. So they're just doing what Spanish Franciscans and Mexican Californios had done yeah. Um, yeah. and just continuing that practice. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you bring us to that early period now because that's that's where you start the book, right? It's like wine coming to California with the missionaries, with the Spanish colonizers, and... What do I have to imagine there? Like, how large a vineyard? Like, how are they producing the wine? Like, labor involved? Like, who's consuming it? Just sort of like, what, what, what's the situation like in colonial California? Yeah. So, if we're on the ground in 1769, you know, imagining Mm -hmm. we're there, the first envoy that came from Baja California. The first priority for the Franciscans was to establish churches. Okay. Number one priority, okay. right? Of course. And they are, of course, conscripting native Californians to do this labor, to mm-hmm. plant dormitories, churches, plant grain fields. And these native laborers are doing this under the direction of natives from Baja California, who mm-hmm. had already done this work of building missions under the direction of missionaries in the southern part of the region. Mm -hmm. So the main priority, building churches and feeding people. You Mm -hmm. can't convert, it's hard to convert people if they're hungry and they're stuck. (laughs) So wine was very important. Um, It was significant for conversion and colonization. Without Mm -hmm. wine, the Franciscans could not say the mass. They could not demonstrate transubstantiation during the Eucharist for the natives. Mm. Feeding them and making sure they weren't starving was the first priority. So it took a bit to Mm. establish vineyards. Mm. Um, It took about 10 years um, Mm. for that to happen. Before that, the Franciscans mostly relied on irregular supply ships, um, you know, that would send up crucifixes, um, you know, barrels of wine, chocolate, yeah. <laughs> uh, or just farm implements from... Right, right. You um, need everything, right? Like... You need everything, everything. Baptismal ledgers, record books, everything. Mm-hmm. So you can see why, you know, wine is important, but it takes mm-hmm. a bit to get to that point. Well, and it's a bit uh, bulky, too, when you think of, like, the barrels, right? It's not like you, bulky, you eat a little bulky. book, sure, but <laughs> barrel of wine... Right. And that supply needed to be replenished regularly because, yeah. yes, they used it in the mass. That was the most important um, use, but they also drank it during meals. This was very common. Um, but once they were able to, they imported uh, vine cuttings. We think they came from Baja California. 
It, and this was the vine that we now know as the mission vine. Mm -hmm. um, and it would in later generations in the 19th century be called the native vine, native to California. It actually wasn't. Uh, mm -hmm. We believe it was imported um, via Spain to, to New Spain, to Mexico, and it slowly evolved and made its way through Baja California up to Alta California. So that was the vine they planted. And they initially, they did try planting vineyards at most of the missions, but some of them existed in climates that were not suitable to mm -hmm. vine cultivation. I'm thinking of, you know, the areas around San Francisco and Santa Cruz that are colder, yeah. um, foggy. They just didn't have suitable climates, yeah. but they were successful in other areas. Mission San Gabriel became known as La Viña Madre. You know, it had the, the largest wow. vineyard. Yeah. Um, and was the most productive. San Fernando mm. was productive. Santa Barbara, mm. uh, all missions that eventually, oh, San Jose uh, was also yeah. um, very well known for its wines. It, the winemaker mm. there was a celebrated winemaker. So mm. the missions that existed in areas with suitable climates planted large vineyards. Sometimes they even planted in the outskirts of um, the mission on properties that they called estancias. And mm. with that, they were able to supply the mission system as well as soldiers, soldiers mm. in the presidios, and sometimes even uh, were able to sell to local colonists. Mm. Wow, impressive. <laughs> now, there's, there's one part that you didn't get tell us about that I found really fascinating, sort of the evolution of like the wine production in California from like the colonial to like Mexican and then eventually US and the industrialization, if we want to call it that, of winemaking California. And that is the very process of taking the grapes and getting the juice out of it. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Now, this was something that was very fraught for yeah. Americans and Euro-American immigrants to California by the 1860s. The old world process of making grapes that had been brought over from Spain mm -hmm. was to stomp them out and gather the juices mm -hmm. um, and then transport them to a suitable, suitable vessel for fermentation. Ideally, this would have been barrels, oak barrels, but in California, that wood was scarce. Mm -hmm. So what was not scarce were cattle skins. Um, many Ugh. of the missions and also in Mexican California, cattle ranching was common. Mm -hmm. uh, so they had ample, ample cattle skin. skins and leather became mm -hmm. a, a vessel for fermenting and storing wine. But other than that, the method that the Franciscans and later the Mexican Californios and later early European immigrants used was for native Californians who were their laborers, sometimes paid, sometimes not, sometimes wow. conscripted or enslaved laborers. Uh, but their duty was to harvest the grapes and stomp them. And then the juices would be collected. They'd go through a sieve and then they'd be fermented. Um, so once we had more scientific, we use scientific in air yes. quotes, here, air quotes. Scientific <laughs> for the 1860s, um, uh, based agriculture, these new migrants to California looked at that process with distaste. Mm. And that was often rooted in the very real racism against natives at the time in the mid 19th century. And they found it incredibly distasteful, unhygienic that native feet were coming in contact with the product that they were going to drink. So what we see happening in, in the mid 19th century is this shift from the old time honored tradition of stomping out the grapes to using mechanized methods. So there were grape presses that would, you know, supposedly separate impurities, you know, rocks, uh, leaves, stems <laughs> from the grapes, you know, and someone often a California native would operate the press mm -hmm. and the juice would be, you know, extracted and it would go, go on through the fermentation process. So I do see uh, this, 
this emphasis on race, on purity, mm -hmm. on producing wine that was, uh, you know, thought to be clean. And all of this, I argue, is related to the American process of colonization mm -hmm. and the American process of moving away from California's Spanish and Mexican past mm -hmm. and embracing and creating a new California that was racially white. Yeah. Even though the labor still was native or Mexican. <laughs> Absolutely. Like... And that's, that's a great irony is that these yeah. vineyards in the 1860s onward, um, many of them were still relying on, you know, native laborers mm -hmm. as they were available until many of them died off due to disease epidemics. Right. And then they transitioned to Chinese workers coming off of the transcontinental mm -hmm. railroad mm -hmm. and Mexican laborers. And mm -hmm. at the same time, they're saying we're not like those Mexican and Spanish wine growers in the past. They are literally planting mission vines. So their yeah. wines are rooted in the past <laughs> yeah yeah it's it, it it's crazy to think about that kind of like how do you the disconnect i guess is the best word of it right of like no i'm different from what the colonial periods winemakers were doing but i'm doing the same thing just that i don't have a native stump the wine i'm just using a native to use a press to <laughs> do the same thing and it's, yeah it's 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 always fascinating how how people can just not connect the dots, I guess, in this case. Mm -hmm. Um now that said let's talk like because I have I, I do not drink wine. I have no clue about wine. So <laughs> you obviously have drank more wine than I have ever in my life. <laughs> Is there like is there a difference between a wine that kind of ages in a barrel versus one that ages in a like cattle hide? Absolutely. I mean, the vessel in which the wine ages or ferments gives it a flavor. There's a reason mm. that today California oak barrel chardonnay has such a rich you know sort of buttery taste the barrel okay, infuses yeah. it does give it some flavor mm -hmm. um so there's all kinds of debates today about you know fermentation in oak barrels versus uh steel they have these big big steel oh, yeah, the steel yes barrels so, or you know, I'm tanks. not as mm -hmm. I'm not as knowledgeable about that. You know, I think that the analogist over at UC Davis, you know, they write entire books about this. And they're so uh, knowledgeable and skilled, but certainly, certainly, there's a difference to it. Um, and I will mention that, you know, the wines made in early California, many of them were on the sweeter side. They were not necessarily Ooh. dry wines. Um, okay. Uh, many times they were a little bit higher in alcohol volume, um, some of these unique characteristics to wine oh, made yeah. the mission grapes at that time. Yeah. No, and in and, and part I was this sort of like, like again, going to kind of Brian's book with regard to sort of the, the challenges that the orange growers face was like moving their, their crops, right? If like, if you, like, yes, you can move an orange fairly fairly easily but eventually it will have an impact if you move it over too long a distance for too long a time you don't have that with wine because it's in a barrel it's a little bit hardier to a long distance move let's say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's the market of california wine like how is it is it by the 1850s 1880s still relatively like the west coast or have they kind of moved and be like engage in competition on the east coast against sort of french or like italian wines by then by the later 19th century many wine growers were expanding their markets mm. absolutely in the early american period in the mexican period winemakers in California had local markets. Mm 
but as the transcontinental railroad is complete mm -hmm. what euro american and american wine growers do is they begin to establish trading houses in the major cities of the eastern and midwestern united states okay. chicago new york new orleans boston and they are there you know some of them even hire agents to market their wines in eastern cities and the, the attitude at the time was that california wine was this sort of spurious sketchy drink that it was <laughs> full of additives and it wasn't pure yeah. um and it wasn't good <laughs> uh -huh. relative to french and and italian wines so i don't know that they were wrong about that but <laughs> about the quality of california wine um mm -hmm. but this was this was their attempt to combat that and one of the ways yeah. that california wine growers did this is by establishing the, the organizations like the california wine association at the turn of the 20th century which was um an organization that part part of its work was marketing really convincing Americans that, hey, California wine is pure. We're using pure grapes. We are not mm -hmm. adding to it. California wine is healthful. It's good for your health. It will prevent drunkenness. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of consumer education that came out of the, the CWA or the California Wine Association. Yeah, it was just like when you mentioned organization and sort of promotion, I was exactly going to ask next about like the um, California wine growers. Um, association sort of like the kind of association in general but i kind of was also um kind of look which when it was but you have this you have this one episode where you talk in the i think it's in the late mid to late 19th century where californian oh yeah here in 1867 where California tries to go to that international exposition in Paris and promote <laughs> its wines. Yeah. And it's this utter disaster, right? Like, like they're not even taken serious here. Now, is that just old world snobbery? Because it's sort of like, ah, these new world people, they don't know how to do wine. Or is it is it real that 1860s California wine just wasn't as good as european wines would have been you know i think it's a little bit of both that's i think certainly there's there was i mean even a hundred years ago with the judgment of paris when uh, you know in the in the 1970s yeah. a little more than 100 years ago there was still snobbery about american wines and california wines. so absolutely that's part of it but i do think that there were issues with california wine at the time and um you know i've not had the privilege of discovering you know a dusty bottle of wine from 18 1867 mm -hmm. or 1865 and and sampling it but we do have evidence that perhaps it was not on par with wines being yeah. produced in other areas um, and again it was very mission wines were often very very sweet very uh mm -hmm. high in their alcohol content a little headier um so it was just a little different mm -hmm. than the wines they were being compared to in France at that time. That would time. be a great project. You know, it's like a local school here in town where I live. They have like, um, well, local schools. It's sort of like a sort of a college. And they produce beer with, with modern technology, obviously, like in Roman times, like Roman beer. Yeah, like, So I kind of was like, maybe, maybe you could get like one of the University of California you know, Calif universities in california to do a science experiment like here's how the missions produced wine and let's produce wine like the missions did and let's see what the result is i think that would be fascinating i know that there are local wine growers here in california especially within the the community of vintners and wine growers who are interested in biodynamic wines, there are oh, people who are growing mission trying. wines and, yeah. um, you know, experimenting with that. I had the privilege of trying a mission wine. Oh gosh, it's been probably 20 years and it wasn't a California mission wine. It was grown in the desert, in the Sonoran desert. Ooh. And at the time I did not think it was very good. Um, Ooh. but I'm told now 
that these wine growers are really, you know, trying to plant things that are more native, um, accustomed to their climate, and they're doing amazing things with this. So I've been meaning to track down a bottle and sample it, you know, for research purposes. Yeah, of course, of course, <laughs> I've not totally. had that opportunity because I think it would be really curious and interesting to try yeah. try a varietal of grape that I've not, you know, yeah. had in a long time yet is so uh fundamental to understanding the history of where i live well there's a research trip i guess mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fascinating when you think of it right like my wife uh, she's been buying some wine at at lidl in austria and every mm -hmm. bottle she buys is california wine really right? yeah oh, they have california wine and lidl in austria it's like you have all the Italian and French and German wines, but there's also California wine. Oh. I, I I hardly ever walk by that section of the store, so I didn't yeah. get kind of look of like how easily can, easily you spot that one, but like I, I guess it's pretty easy to see like, oh, there's a California wine. Mm -hmm. Global brand today. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's amazing that, I mean, California produces over 90% of American wine, um, including the export. So it doesn't surprise me. Yeah. But I, I'd be curious to compare the prices, you know, because um, I know, mm. you know, does the import taxes raise prices? Because wine is so affordable in Europe relative to the United States. Uh, so. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, like buy, a, buying a beer in Europe is cheaper than buying a soda. Right. Or water. Um, yeah. So yeah. that would be, uh, that's an interesting question. Let me see. I might actually be able to tell. Uh, I, let me do is two samples. Uh, about. Under two euro for the bottle of wine. Under two euro for a bottle of wine. And then yep. is that a European wine or an American wine? No, I think this is a European wine. Okay, so that would make sense to me. Maybe no, I American. think American wine. I think oh, it's American. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I think it's American. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Want me to ship some back? <laughs> That's probably the worst. <laughs> Mm. Shipping costs are too expensive for individuals <laughs> like us. <laughs> right. Um, so, giving an eye on the time here for us. Ooh. So, one of the themes of your your book is settler colonialism, which is like a, a major part topic in in a lot of Western history today. Like whether it's dealing with Native Americans, Western lands, uh, growing of crops, and obviously with California, we're also dealing, and especially Southern California, with a lot of water issues. Right? Let's call it that because Southern California is a very dry climate. So how do how do you see the problems of irrigation, planting wine, kind of intersect and engage sort of that larger theme you have in the book with with regard to settler colonialism? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's oh, a big that question. question. Yeah, I love that question. Um, well, I will say first off that you know California natives had their own system of resource management and land management. Mm -hmm. And that knowledge, you know, many times the Franciscans just ignored it, right? And brought said, no, we have our own agricultural experts come, that we've brought from Baja California. And that knowledge was often lost. They also relied on uh, an agricultural manual that they brought with them from Spain. Luckily, <laughs> the climate in California is very Mediterranean like that of Spain. So they lucked mm -hmm. out yeah. in that they had success simply because of that accident, accident that their place of origin had a climate that was very similar yeah. to where they landed here in Alta California. So in Spanish California, 
we'll say that the Spanish missionaries, um, the pobladores, the Mexican colonists, mm -hmm. uh, and then later in Mexican California, the Californios did build irrigation systems. Sometimes they reflected um, systems of water use that California natives had used. They just kind of built mm -hmm. over those. Um, other times they were newer and accessing water from different rivers that, you know, California natives hadn't been using for um, their own resource use. Mm -hmm. um, so these, these sanjas were, were in existence when Americans came. Okay. I will also say that some vineyardists, um, again, stretching across the three political periods I discussed, Spanish, Mexican, and American, simply did not irrigate their grapes heavily. The thinking mm. being that uh, you didn't need to water grapes that much because the roots would dig down deep to access um, groundwater. And also that a little bit of struggle for the grapes was good you might not have as large a crop but the flavor of the grapes was thought to be more concentrated and a little mm -hmm. bit better so you know grapes are a little bit of a fussy they're a fussy crop you know too much yeah. water is not good for them um too little though is not good for them so they weren't you know 100 percent wrong about uh the concentrated flavor of the grapes uh, mm -hmm. which is interesting. But I think that your broader point, though, is that part of this history looks at the process of conquest of the landscape and the environment, mm -hmm. right? How, yeah. how are these settler colonialists coming in and you know superseding, erasing, overriding mm -hmm. native land use? What what are the consequences of the water they use? What are the consequences of the foreign plants and animals they introduced mm -hmm. to the region? I mean, just with that last point, we know that the consequences were really significant for California natives in disrupting mm -hmm. their own food supplies. Yeah. So you can go at that at that question from so many angles. Um, mm -hmm. And I, environmental history isn't a huge focus of my book, but I hope someone writes that environmental mm -hmm. history of California wine because it's missing and it's just so important to understanding right. the transformation of California across the long 19th century. Well, yeah, and it, it goes back to the same point of like the natives are the ones that, yeah, they're the ones dying out and dying off and mm -hmm. it's... Mm -hmm. It, it was their land and the, at the start of all of it. And mm -hmm. they're the ones suffering at the end, which is the, the kind of mm -hmm. sad reality of it. On the other hand, so it's like with any food crop, you're always dependent on the environment, right? Like I just saw a picture in the news because the mountains got some snow over the weekend. And you have pictures of like these, like not more large, but these wine fields and there's snow on it and all these <laughs> vineyards are kind of like oh god this is going to be terrible mm -hmm. so you're always dependent on sort of the environment as as a farmer as anyone engaged in agriculture how about like you already mentioned pierce disease if i remember correctly and then we also have like in in europe i remember they had a big big disease too that almost decimates the French wine industry. How much is disease a problem for, for vineyards? It's a huge problem. Again, grapevines are delicate. Um, and I mentioned Pierce, Pierce's disease earlier and how it hasn't gone away. Even today, mm -hmm. if you mention the glassy wow. wing sharpshooter, which is the vector of that disease, if you mention it, it's going to be in the news and growers are going to be taking that very seriously and will be wow. incredibly vigilant and monitoring their vineyards for any sign. I mean, this is the reason why if you've ever driven into California, you will be stopped and asked to, at yeah. the Arizona-California border, you're stopped and asked to... You know, hey, you got any fruit? Yep, I have a banana and an orange. Sorry, it's got to stay here. There's a reason we monitor that so closely. Mm. Um, but if we go back to the 19th century, I mean, your mention of phylloxera, that also made an appearance in California, uh, specifically Northern California, Napa mm. and Sonoma, 
on uh, Vitis vinifera vines. These were European grape varietals. And okay. they were very, very susceptible to the phylloxera louse. It's a louse that attaches itself to um, the root stock and slowly mm. kills the wine. And it's a complicated process, but I'm giving you the Cliff's yeah. Note version okay. there. Um, but what ends up happening with that episode is American and French wine growers had to collaborate essentially to mm. um Basically, they used American grape stock, which was disease resistant. It was resistant to phylloxera. It had uh, evolved uh, and developed that resistance. So they they grafted American yeah. disease resistant grape vines to the Vitis vinifera vines, the French vines. Yeah. And that is how they were able to save the wine industry in France and in the United States. And this is this is a fascinating hmm. area of study that many people have written books on. Yeah. Well, kind of irony, right? So the Americans have to rescue the French wine industry, and <laughs> even though the French don't <laughs> like American wine. Um, uh, so speaking of, there's like two more topics that I definitely want to talk about. And one of them is like the racism. And when we, when I have, been with the orange empire he or oranges citrus lemon empire he had these incredible images in his book of like racism of like these these orange growers putting like this whitewash past on the boxes on like the wrappings of the oranges or like like native americans and sort of war bonnets and like the like utter racism do we have something similar with the wine industry that kind of like racism with regard to like Native Americans or Hispanics to kind of give a whitewashed past of the vineyards? Absolutely. Absolutely. Part of that has to do with the concerns about cleanliness and, you know, Indian mm -hmm. feet versus the machines that I've already discussed. But one of the areas I explore um, in terms of this race making and citizenship access to citizenship it involves access to wine right who mm -hmm. had legal access to enjoy wine not california natives and that is something mm -hmm. that was true across spanish mexican and american california where they were it was strictly prohibited it to give them wine. Now, did growers give it to them as a form of payment? Absolutely, they did. And these California natives would drink it over the weekend, mm -hmm. you know, on Saturday night after payday, if they were yeah. being paid. Sometimes they were paid um, in lieu of cash wages. They were given wine against the law. <laughs> they would drink it in downtown Los Angeles. Um, it would be a great raucous party, some a violent party in downtown mm -hmm. Los Angeles. And then on Sunday night or Monday morning, they would be rounded up, arrested, and then essentially sold out as convict laborers to the very vineyardists who paid them in wine. <laughs> Another area we see is in wages. I have instance, I found instances in the archives where growers would describe the process of paying their workers, their vineyard workers. Um, the example I used was Leonard J. Rose, who was a German wine grower with a vineyard in what is now like San Marino, Pasadena. And per his son and, and those memories, his father on Saturday nights, payday, would stand on the porch and pay some of his employees. And the way it worked was white men who worked at his vineyard, Sunny Slope, would get paid whenever they felt like it. So if they wanted to draw wages on a Wednesday, they could. They could be paid for, you know, Monday, when, Monday Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, Mexican workers were paid on Saturday night and each one would go and interact with El Patron, the boss. He would pay oh, them their cash wages and also give them some wine as part of their wages. Um, and that was true for white men as well. Interestingly, oh. Chinese men never interacted with Leonard J. Rose themselves. They had one appointed person who would meet with Leonard J. Rose once a month, and that person would collect wages for the entire work crew. 
um, and no wine was included. <laughs> and their wages were, of course, less. So these were prorated by race. Good God. <laughs> That's yeah. just terrible. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, but that's those stories, right? You know, right. And this is the process by which race and citizenship and hierarchies yeah. were made. Um, we know from um, the work of Natalia Molina, race isn't made in a vacuum, right? It's relational. Yeah. Um, so this is part of the process by which race was made in, in California. Yeah, yeah. And that that sort of exactly leads to where I kind of wanted to go was the final question for us tonight uh, that. I, I, when I when I read your book, I kind of was seeing like 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 two big intersections, right? On in part, it seemed like your book exactly speaks to like what we have with the Gilded Age. Like, there's a crop, there's an industry. It it modernizes, it industrializes, it embraces all kinds of new technology, and then these monopolies start to develop. Like mm -hmm. it's a, sort of a stereotypical Gilded Age story, but then we see reimagining of race it also felt like we have that what elliot west has described that greater reconstruction of in the america sort of that re rethinking of how this race question in the united states plays out and it's not just black and white in the south after slavery but it's it's black it's white it's hispanic it's native american it's chinese it's it's so many of them in the west so it, i felt like you had sort of these two big seams that just kind of started to work together there as the book got into the mid to late 19th century. Yeah. Thank you for that insight. You know, this is a, it's a California story, but it's not, not an American story. It is right. of course an American story and, yeah. and reflective of what is happening in the rest of the country at that time. So absolutely, um, I think what is what is unique to California is although there is this nostalgic memory of mm -hmm. human Jeffersonian farmers, I argue, I would argue, and I think you know this is this is true in the historiography um, on California that really never existed here. We yeah. had very early on large scale farms, right? Large mm -hmm. landowners who could not possibly yeah. farm or cultivate their property alone. They mm -hmm. needed workers, whether they were conscripted or enslaved natives, later on Mexican or Chinese wage workers or white men who were wage workers. So that's absolutely part of the story. And then managing those large swaths of property relied mm -hmm. on, I mean, they needed mechanization, right. fertilizer, modern science to be able to use that land productively. So it's absolutely part of the latter half of the 19th century in the modernization and mechanization of agriculture. The other part about what you said about Americans moving past that black white binary is so important. And I think it's interesting in California, um, what the literature tells us and what I found in my own research was the fact that there were so many different groups here uh, California natives, Spanish Californios, Mexicans, mm -hmm. Irish, Italians, Germans, Chinese. It complicated the understanding of race that migrants from the Eastern states brought with them. They looked around and they said, hey, it's not just us and Black Americans here. There are other people. Mm -hmm. And what is interesting in terms of the wine industry um, and the groups involved there is that European immigrants, I I would argue, and others have argued as well, use that to assert mm -hmm. their own whiteness and claim American citizenship far earlier than they were able to do in other parts of the country. Um, in, in my book, it's a lot of Germans who, mm -hmm. even though they still speak German and retain German culture, are celebrated for bringing modernity and American industriousness to the um, Los Angeles area. And right. what, yeah. between the lines, what, what people meant was whiteness. They're bringing whiteness. Yeah. yeah. In the Midwest, Germans were not celebrated for that. They were seen yes. as foreign. Yeah. Uh, and certainly the Irish, even worse in yeah. the Eastern states where they were 
absolutely prohibited from claiming the rights of American citizenship in the 19th century. That just wasn't wasn't available to them, but in California it was. And yeah. you know, one of the the big points I make, um, if we move broader, is that California's 19th century wine industry was really multiracial, it was multi-ethnic. Mm-hmm. And I think it challenges the perception that California wine was the endeavor, was the sole endeavor of Italian American immigrants. Oh, no. Were they were they important to the California wine industry? Absolutely they were, especially in the 20th century. But to say that they I think one of the words that I often see associated with California's um, Italian American winemakers is that they were pioneers. Mm. And I would argue that word is a fallacy because yeah. they came in at the turn of the 20th century and again after World War II and built up an industry that already existed. Mm. <laughs> they didn't build it from scratch. And I think it's important to look at that and sort of claim a space and say, hey, the California wine industry was born from the labor of native peoples, of Chinese immigrants, Mexicans, Californios, Germans, Chinese, I mentioned the Chinese already, Irish immigrants. It is really an amazing story that is not just about one group. That is a perfect end. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, and exactly right. That's like there's so much to untangle in that of all the different peoples that are involved, and like it's just the thing a lot of people enjoy has such a complicated racial history in in California. It's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, so with that, um, you have your meeting coming up here in a few minutes thank you so much julia for joining us today for this really enlightening conversation about california wine her book just as a reminder for everyone the grapes of conquest race labor and the industrialization of california wine is available with the university of nebraska press very interesting book to to read if you want to know more about wine in california and its long history again thank thank you you so much. much thanks for having me